All right, pipe down in front. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Had a good conference so far? All right, now the really important question, who has not bought their ticket for PubCon tonight? Buy your ticket for PubCon tonight. There are only 12 left. It's OK. I won't judge you for using your phone right now. Um, <laughs> uh, is anybody not familiar with PubConf? Yeah, never been before? OK, I got a hand in the back. All right, um, this is not an understatement. Nobody would ever accuse me of bullshitting, but it is the most amazing after party you will ever attend in your damn life. So 10 out of 10 would recommend. Uh, 10 speakers, invite only, Ignite style talks, meaning we have five minutes, 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide, and no clicker. They auto progress. Um, so you can look forward to hearing some amazing talks. I believe Damien's going to be talking about how to code like an arsehole. Uh, Lemon will be giving a brilliant talk called uh, How to Please Your VP by Hating Your User. Uh, and of course, to appeal to a certain demographic, I will be talking about if choosing a JavaScript framework was like an episode of The Bachelor. Uh, so it'll be a great time to come out tonight. Hope to see you all there. And I promise it will be worth your money. And even if you want to boo at us, you got beer to drink. So we'll call that a win. But right now, we are going to talk about working remote. So yay. Uh, before we get started, do want to say thanks to all our sponsors. There's really a lot of work that goes into putting on a conference like this and making sure that tickets are kept at an affordable price and can bring in great speakers and, and have a great venue. Uh, so please absolutely show some love to the sponsors, because they really help make this possible, as well as show love to the DC staff because they are wonderful, lovely, fantastic human beings who put on a really stellar conference, in my opinion. <clears throat> uh, a little bit about me. Uh, name is Jennifer Wadella. You can follow me on Twitter at like OMG It's Buddy. I do warn people that I do live tweet The Bachelor on Monday night. So you've been warned. Sorry, not sorry. I am a nine to five remote software engineer. I work at a tiny legal startup uh, in the US writing Angular. I run a nonprofit on the side, uh, helping get more women into tech careers, do a lot of speaking, and I am an aspiring crazy plant lady, um, a hobby I have been able to, to adopt since working from home and, and having plenty of time to water my babies in the morning when my uh, code is compiling. <clears throat> I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, so for all those who are like, hey, where are you from? And I'm like, the States, and they're like, but no, where? I'm like, literally in the fucking middle. Nobody cares where I'm from. Uh, but Kansas City is a great place. We do have a great uh, developer conference uh, in July every year, so if you ever get the chance to come visit us, uh, we will treat you right. <clears throat> Remote working, so hot right now. Uh, OK, just, just so I can get a feel, does anybody rem work remote right now? A couple hands, all right. Who wants to work remote? Who isn't sure if they want to work remote? <laughs> <laughs> Who currently ro works remote and feels like they suck at working remote? <laughs> OK, awesome, great. So hopefully there will be a little bit of everything uh, in here for you. Mm -mm. OK, so what this talk is not is going to be me talking for 60 minutes about how fucking awesome remote working is, because we all know that. I work remote. I get to travel to Australia, um, take selfies with cuddly creatures like quokkas. <laughs> yes, that's a real animal. Um, so a lot of this talk is really going to be about figuring out, um, first of all, if a, the company you're currently working for or a company you're interested in working for is going to be able to support remote, remote workers, deciding if working remote is, is the right fit for you as an individual, um, learning strategies to be more effective, um, and finally exploring a couple different ways to, to approach working remote. <clears throat> so this is huge. Um, you think it's easy enough um, to just be yourself you know, and go and find a remote job and everything's going to be fine, but that's really not the case. Um, you're really only ever going to be able to be as successful as your environment allows, meaning if your company is not set up to support you and, and to um, have everything available for you to be the best and most productive and most efficient worker, if they're not set up for that, then you aren't going to be no matter how hard you try. Um, and that's just that's the realism of the world. I'm a very pragmatic person, as you will come to find. Um, and, and so you really need to be considerate of the environment you're walking into if you really want to do your best. Um, so I have kind of created what I call this remote company checklist. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, this has been created by a lot of horror stories that I've experienced in, in my time of remote work and uh, some catastrophes. But this is a checklist that I look for when I'm evaluating job options or talking to a peer about whether they want to start working remote or not. And these are kind of some of the considerations that I think you need to be aware of. And this is uh, to make sure that they do have an onboarding process, uh, that they have me meetings that are built to be inclusive of, rem of remote workers. <clears throat> Excuse me have clear and always available task management, are effective communicators, always a doozy, um, have documentation around what I call tribal knowledge, and finally have appropriate performance evaluation metrics in place. 
Um, and so we'll kind of talk through all of these. Um, <clears throat> and don't worry about taking notes or if you want to take photos, that's fine. But I will tweet out sl slides at the end so you don't have to panic. Um, but this is kind of the checklist that I use when I'm evaluating companies and how well they can support me because obviously I'm a badass worker and uh, that's not even in question. So. Um, first of all, talking about an onboarding process. This doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be like perfectly printed, like documents and swag and t-shirts and notebooks. Like who writes in a notebook anymore? Um, but it is important to have some sort of onboarding because again, you're not in person. Um, you're losing out on a lot of things that you would have on an in-person workplace. You can't just wander up to somebody's cubicle or, oh, excuse me, open desk these days and say, hey, like I, I wasn't sure how to get started on this or how do I connect to the printer? Oh wait, we don't have to worry about that either. Um, onboarding should absolutely outline expectations and policies. Um, if this is your first remote job, there might be some things or some nuances that are important to a remote company lifestyle that you might not be aware of. They might have certain expectations for how they want their remote team uh, workers to you know, act and behave in, in the environment, whether they need to check in or kind of policies they have. So in onboarding, you need to make sure that they are clearly outlining what their expectations and policies are for you to make sure you're meeting their requirements. Onboarding should uh, highlight appropriate company and third party contacts. Again, when you're working remote, you're losing a lot of organic opportunities to, to kind of meet people and, and hear names dropped and that kind of thing. Um, so it's really important to have some sort of um, <clears throat> documentation letting you know who the people are that you're going to need to get a hold of. Um, this could be, you know, certain people in leadership and project management, HR, um, depending on your job role. I'm a software engineer, so mostly it's just. Uh, whoever's assigning me code and then whoever's requiring, writing requirements. But if you are somebody who works with maybe third party vendors or some company partners, making sure that um, all those people that you need to be able to get in touch with are outlined. Onboarding should include equipment specs. Are you expected to buy your own laptop and get re uh, reimbursed for it? Are they going to send you theirs? What about hard drives? Um, if you have never worked remote for the first time, are they going to give you an ergonomic keyboard? Are they going to give you an allowance to kind of set up your office the way you want to be productive? Um, I know those standing desks are pretty sweet. Is that one of the things that they would um, consider purchasing for you? Um, so these are all things to make sure that you're aware of when um, exploring a company that might support remote. <clears throat> Um, onboarding should provide access to necessary communication tools. Again, because we're in an online environment, we're going to be relying on tools instead of face-to-face -face conversations, um, possibly even phone calls. So whether they're on Slack or Trillion or I guess HipChat just got bought, so that's going away. But um, whatever the tool is, make sure you have the appropriate access. Uh, I did work one of the last remote places I worked. They had Skype. They had Trillion. They had Google Hangouts. Um, we started moving to Slack, but then the CEO got pissed because we were being passive aggressive with our emojis, and so they started shutting down Slack access. We've got so many horror stories about that place, by the way. Um, but yeah, like I literally got onboarded, and there's like all these fucking tools. And uh, when, when I was talking to the company, I'd be talking to people, and I'm like, well, what's the worst thing about working here? And the developers are all like, so many communication tools. Ugh. Um, but it is important to make sure that you have access to those to get a hold of who you need. <clears throat> okay. So when we talk about meetings being inclusive of, a rem of remote workers, this is going to be um, more important if you are working at a company where you're one remote worker or maybe there's a small team where the company isn't entirely remote because it's really easy <laughs> to forget about you because if you're not in the room and they're not seeing you, they don't necessarily remember. So. Uh, Guard yourself and make sure that you're um, being very pragmatic in your approach to making sure you have all your resources, um, <clears throat> but making sure you understand how their meetings work. Um, many, many years ago, I worked at a marketing agency, and uh, one of the women on our team, uh, she was a business analyst, was in Chicago, and we're in Kansas City. And so has anybody seen one of these robots before there, that you mount the iPad and she can like drive it around? Um, so it was a really cool way to include her because she was the only one not remote on our team, but it gave her this complete control to like be present in our building. And uh, it was a marketing agency and it was all designed and everything. So we had like these open meeting windows and stuff. And I'll never remember there was one time that we were in a meeting, had forgotten about poor Tisha, our remote worker. And so she had driven the bot and the door was closed. She can't open the door. And so like this, this part of it is adjustable. And so like the window is probably about here. And you just see this like <laughs> iPad like <laughs> popping up to creep through the window. It's the most amazing thing. We're like, oh shit, <laughs> somebody let Tisha in. Um, <laughs> So, you know, just having those considerations and tools available. And uh, one other story, uh, Halloween, she was driving around and some of the parents had bought their kids to work. And I couldn't find the video of it because it's from like five or six years ago. But like you see Tisha come like tearing around the corner in a pink boa on her robot, getting chased by this like toddler in a dinosaur costume. <laughs> 
Um, so anyway, no, no reason you can't have fun with remote workers, but those are, those are some fun stories and experiences that have been really great for the team as far as culture and, and, and having fun with meetings. But meetings um, should absolutely always be on the calendar. Uh, again, in an office, it's really easy to just grab somebody and be like, hey, let's get coffee, let's talk through this idea, let's brainstorm. Um, oh, let's get a smoke break, let's go outside and talk through this. Remote workers are always gonna be forgotten and left out of that. So um, it's very important to have a culture that's gonna make sure important meetings are on the ca calendar and shifting a culture to not have those one-off conversations where they're only between two people or in some certain environment, but making sure to include everyone. <clears throat> uh, meetings should always include the necessary join links, numbers, and access codes. So whatever your meeting tool is or access code or phone number you have to dial in, um, there are plenty of tools to auto-generate those in the meeting, um, but that can be a big struggle because if you're supposed to be online and you don't have the access code and you're trying to ping somebody but they're already running the meeting, whole bunch of drama there. So being aware of the way those links are set out and whatever you can do to kind of push and say, hey, make sure we, we get these uh, links ahead of time will really um, help your progress. <clears throat> meetings should be scheduled in consideration of workers in different time zones. And obviously this can be difficult and you have to be aware of um, you know where all your employees are and everything, but I swear to God, do not schedule anything on my lunch break or I'll be hangry as hell. Um, <clears throat> but kind of understand what the layout and what the demographics of the team would be and what those meeting times would look like and if they are going to work for your life and your schedule. Because um, why do we want to work remote unless we can be flexible and do all the things that we want in life that are offered by a remote, um, a remote workplace. Okay. Here is a big one. Have clear and always available task management because nobody wants to be at work and not able to work. Like we're engineers, we're, we're pretty fortunate that we pretty much like what we do and I don't know about you, but like if I get in and I'm raring to go on a Monday morning and I wanna write some code and, and I'm not aware of my tasks and I don't know what to work on, I get kind of pissy and then I browse Reddit and then like productivity is lost the rest of the day. So clear and always available task management is key. As a remote worker, I wanna be able to get online anytime, anywhere, like if I'm upside down in Australia, um, and view my workload and have the documentation I need to make sure that I can execute on my role. Again, this goes back to that idea of no matter how hard we try or how effective we are, we can only be as good as our environment is allowing. <clears throat> if this is the company's task management system, run. Run fast, run hard, run very far away because this will never translate well to remote workers. Um, I know it's the fun Vogue thing, but this is hard to track. If you're homesick uh, for the day or if you've got a kid that you've got to take to the dentist or something like that, you're not gonna be able to get work done if this is the only way they ta ta track their tasks. Excuse me. Um, so yes, this is definitely not an efficient task management system. And it's 20 freaking 18. We have a million like task management tools. There's just no excuse for this anymore. <clears throat> Uh, doesn't matter what the tool is, if you're tracking issues in GitHub, if you're um, tracking your sprints in Trello, um, maybe if you're even using Jira, if that doesn't scare the crap out of you, it does not matter what your tool is. Because all we want to be doing is this, right? Um, all our task management system needs to do is allow uh, employees to be as autonomous as they can to pick up the work they need and communicate their pro project. Wow, you can tell it's the end of the week. Their process on a ticket. Um, again, we're losing everything that we have when we're working with people in person. So you can't just like pop over a cue ball and be like, hey, sorry, this mic is killing me. Um, you can't just be able to pop over to somebody and say, hey, here's my status on this or, or what's the status on this. We need to be communicating and over communicating communicating almost when we're um, talking about our tasks and everything that we have going on, especially if we have different time zones that people are working across. Tasks should have clearly outlined requirements. Um, we're again losing that in-person contact and if you don't know how you're supposed to be executing on a ticket or you don't know what the requirements are or what the expectations are, there's gonna be a lot of back and forth, QA is gonna be pissed, you're gonna be pissed, project management is gonna be pissed and nobody is happy. So make sure that um, whatever this task management system has, it has the outline, the requirements outlined. And again, this is more of a, a people in a process thing but it's important to be aware of the company paying attention to that. Um, eh, come back, okay. Um, have steps for completion. So if there are certain items on this ticket that are required to be complete or maybe it has a sub-ticket or something like that, um, make sure those are outlined on the task. You're aware if nobody's in the office, you can figure out what's going on, that kind of thing. And have priorities or due dates. Um, again, you're losing out on those organic conversations that'll happen in an in-office setting. And so if priorities are shifting or maybe there was a big client meeting and that kind of changed priorities and that doesn't get communicated to you or the rest of the team, everybody's gonna be set up to, for failure. So make sure those tasks are always being updated with priorities and due, date, due dates. <sighs> are effective communicators. 
And uh, this is the hardest one because as human beings, pretty much all our problems come down to being terrible communicators. You can get better, it is okay, but if you're a bad communicator, this is absolutely gonna make a remote environment suck so much worse. If a company is bad at communication in person, they're gonna be really, really damn bad at communicating remote. So, um, kind of things to watch out for when you're talking to either your company or, or a potential company you wanna work for. Pay attention to the way they, commu they communicate and make sure that they are conveying information because all of the breakdowns and problems will lead to this. Communication considerations. How is company-wide information relayed? Like if something really big happens within the company, whether it's deadline shifting or, or new client work or maybe new policies or an acquisition, is that company or is that information gonna be relayed to everyone? Is, are the remote workers gonna be forgotten in that? Um, is there some sort of like monthly meeting that happens to kind of keep everybody on the same page? How do they handle that level of communication? What tools are used for daily communication? Um, I mean, if we're, we're picky people, we all have our preferences, I'm not gonna lie, if I was talking to a company and they're like, oh no, we don't use Slack, I'd be like <laughs> So um, be aware of, of what tools they are using for their communication and, and how they use them, or if it's tool overload and you're not that kind of person who can manage a million different avenues, that's important to be aware of. Um, again, how is the team made aware of goals and progress and changes? Is everybody in the loop and understanding what's going on and not getting sidelined when you're in the middle of a meeting and they're like, oh, well, yeah, this thing that we talked about the other day and you're like, what other day? Like, nobody told me about that. And these are things that can happen, again, really easily leaving remote workers out of the mix. Um, what happens when you have a blocker from somebody who is out of the office or out on leave or something like that? You don't have this like physical manifestation of a person in, per in a person, right? And so you're trying to figure out, okay, are they really gone from the keyboard? Are they done for the day? Like what's going on? How does the company handle that? And how do you make sure that you can, again, autonomously is my favorite word for this talk, um, execute as autonomously as you can, especially when in, in the development world, sometimes we depend on others. <clears throat> One-on-ones. Uh, in my opinion, no excuses. If a company does not do one-on-ones with their team, uh, they are making bad choices. I, and especially at a remote company where you are losing out visual cues and emotional cues and all the, the kind of things we rely on as humans. Um, if the company isn't doing one-on-ones with their team members to check in on progress and see how they're doing and hear complaints or concerns or anything like that, I really don't see how those prog problems aren't gonna magnify. Um, so I joke about being a nine to five software engineer because that is my day job. I, I like being a happy little code monkey, but then I run a nonprofit and I actually manage 50 people at this nonprofit. And we don't have an office, so we are essentially a remote company. Yes, we are all in the Kansas City area, um, but we very much manage it like a remote company and we do one-on-ones with our team members to check in because it's really easy to just lose that human connection and people will get really upset about something and there's not a chance to bring it up and then it just boils up and boils up and boils up and then you have immense drama. Um, so we definitely check in with our people and we're very conscious. Um, we're even really conscious about Slack usage because not everybody can be on Slack all the time at their offices. Um, we've got some people that work at some federal institutions or companies that have more lockdowns um, than some of us who are um, able to work pretty um, freely on whatever we want. Um, and so we're very conscious about making sure that any really important conversation gets relayed via email where everybody will see in, instead of Slack where it can get lost up the page in a conversation, right? Um, so yes, yeah, very much paying attention to the way the company communicates and, and how inclusive they are is important for your success. Having documentation around tribal knowledge, and this is the worst one I feel for companies. Can you guys read that okay? Oh, like waits for laugh. <laughs> okay, well, he's asking about documentation and he's got a function that says save user uh, token and the comments say save token of the user. So yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> So it is really important to have documentation um, around what I call tribal knowledge, and that's when you have a product and it started great, right? And it was on the brand new amazing sleek framework and all the code was perfect and anything, but then like the client had this weird demand and so you had to do this little hacky thing here. But then like business couldn't make up their mind on a feature and you know they're gonna go back anyway, so you comment it out for now because you know they're just gonna come back in like another three weeks and decide they wanted it the original way, so you've commented that out. And they just this stuff starts to pile up, right? And of course I know that because that's tribal knowledge. But uh, what happens when I'm scuba diving in the Great Barrier Reef and, and my team stumbles across some of my code and they're like, so what was that bitch thinking when she did that, you know? Um, so having some sort of um, understanding and realization about the fact that people are gonna be reading code at different times and if you're not around to answer the questions for why the hell you did that um, 
or some sort of documentation. Uh, to break this down a little more, uh, everybody, I want you to repeat after me. Slack does not equal documentation. Slack does not equal documentation. Slack does not equal documentation. I swear to God, this drives me up the wall. Like, if you're going to tell me that I need to do something or run migrations and you post it in Slack and then I'm in the middle of something and two days later I'm like, hey, uh, what happened with this? And you're like, didn't you see my Slack message? No, I was working. Slack is not documentation. Okay. And rant. <laughs> All right. So there should be documentation around environment setup. Um, and I feel like this is always the worst drama. I've been on so many teams before where uh, they'll have some just insane like vagrant setup or, or something weird with Docker or all these weird nuances. And you only ever do it like once a lot of the time. And then everybody forgets what's going on. And then, oh, maybe something happens with your machine and you have to wipe it and start all over again. Or there's drama and none of it's documented. So we're like, oh shit, what did we do when we solved this one awkward weird problem that only happened on one person's environment? Um, so having good documentation around environment setup is key. Um, actually, when I was at a marketing agency, uh, I moved onto this team, and it was a two-day setup time, and we were building like a fucking Korean Air website. Like it was not anything crazy we were doing, but two days of setup time, and it wasn't very well documented. So, uh, documentation around that, um, documentation around build processes, what your expectations are, if there's anything um, interesting going on there. Uh, my last place, we had a gatekeeper sysadmin, and he would not give anyone access to anything. So like, if he got hit by a bus, we were all screwed because we couldn't get in to do anything we need. Granted, he was coding himself in, into job security because the CEO was that bat shit that he was kind of protecting himself. But um, documentation around build processes in a functioning nice team will, will be huge. Um, documentation around testing, what are your expectations? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I forgot to update a unit test uh, a couple months ago, and I was like, oh, shoot, like, I think the, the tests are failing because I forgot to update this. Let me go fix it. And he's like, oh, no, it's passing fine. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, yeah, I have all your tests disabled right now. <laughs> have documentation around your testing. Let your engineers know uh, what's going on. <laughs> so they might cry themselves to sleep at night after a couple glasses of whiskey. Um, documentation around deployment, especially if you have one person who is doing the deployment, what happens if they get hit by a bus? Um, and you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, well, this isn't you know, necessary for remote, right? This should be an editing company. Well, yes, but everything is gonna be harder with remote. So um, having documentation around deployment, how that needs to happen, um, and any changes that happen as that process changes over time. Um, company code standards, here's another one. Uh, don't have a bitch fit at somebody if they're using tabs versus spaces if you guys don't have it documented anywhere. How are they gonna know? Um, don't be a Richard. <clears throat> but yeah, as your company grows, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Glad to get my jokes. Um, have documentation around your company coding standards so um, people can come on board, they can get on board, they can read, they can understand what's going on. As you guys grow and as you change, you know, frameworks and erase technical debt, constantly be updating um, and making this easy to manage for people to get in and read um, so everybody can be on the same page and around documentation. <clears throat> um, and kind of just other stuff. Migrations, environment changes, anything that you will probably forget about as you're um, coding in your day-to-day -day activity, which may affect somebody else who comes in later or um, is off doing something else and jumping back onto a project you're on. Um, having an, like a living documentation of um, everything that's going on around migrations and environment changes, um, access codes, anything like that, always be updating documentation for. Um, again, Autonomous, favorite word, should always be available to help workers execute as autonomously as they can because that's how we're gonna be effective as remote workers, right? We need to be able to work all the time and not get hung up because we're not able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with someone. <clears throat> and finally, uh, have appropriate performance evaluation <laughs> systems in place. Yeah, it's a true story from my last job, by the way. Um, the CEO decided we were going to be evaluated by how many times our tickets got reopened. And this is somebody who was a little fire happy too. Um, so the problem is a lot of, of companies use butt and seat as a crutch for evaluations. It doesn't really matter if you're sitting on your butt browsing Reddit for eight hours a day. They don't know because you're in your seat. So as far as they know, butt and seat equals productivity. Well, in the real world, that doesn't actually work. So it's kind of cool because remote work, when you evaluate your workers, it's more based on the actual work they do and not how much time their butt is in a chair. Um, but the, the struggle in transitioning to that is that is a big mental leap for a lot of employers. <clears throat> 
So some kind of things to consider when you're looking at how they evaluate employees and how they make their decisions. Um, these are the kind of things we need to be looking out for. Who is setting the evaluation metrics? Is it some marketing CEO who has no idea what they're doing and is assuming that um, the number of times a ticket has been reopened is an appropriate metric for a developer's efficacy? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what is the technical expertise of management? Do they have enough of an understanding of the work we do to really set appropriate metrics? Again, they are basically flying blind, right? They can't see us sitting in a chair, so they can't just assume we're doing what we're doing. What tools do they have to figure out or evaluate in their minds the work we're doing and why we are worth our paychecks? Um, what metrics are currently in place? Are they doing annual reviews? Like, what are the kind of things they are looking for? What does the current existing team have to say about these? Um, uh, evaluation metrics. If you are um, working at a company and like approaching them about going remote, how are you going to navigate that and, and how are you going to meet their expectations and, and how do you begin to approach that conversation around, well, okay, um, how is my performance going to be evaluated? Because again, they're used to your butt being in a seat, right? That equals productivity. No. Um, so kind of uh, helping coach along uh, what needs to happen there. Um, how is performance judged? Again, um, I mean, is this you just get all your sprint work completed on time? Um, is this you are writing a certain amount of uh, lines of code? Uh, what are the kind of things that they're going to look for? Um, obviously, you would want the kind of place that lets you set your own goals and then work towards those goals in achieving that, um, which would be, again, a very autonomous way to um, talk about performance valuations, but I am pragmatic and there are a lot of shitty companies out there. So things to be aware of are that they may not uh, go along something like that and are going to have weird performance metrics. Um, essentially, how are you going to prove to them you're worth your paycheck when they can't see you? Especially if they're not the people reading your code, especially if they're not the people who are testing the product that you're helping write. Um, how does some you know, bean counter know that you are, are making an impact in the company? <clears throat> Again, you can only be as successful as your environment will allow. Uh, companies with remote workers will have their successes and more importantly, their failures magnified. Um, so the things they're good at, they'll be really good at remote. The things they're really bad at in person, they will be really, really bad at remotely. So uh, always keep that in mind. Okay, so is rem working remote the right fit for you? And I like to talk about this second because I'm kind of talking about all the challenges and considerations of a remote company. And so if you're walking into a situation that's maybe less than perfect, do you have the right personality to make up for all those imperfections that a company might have? Um, when we talk about you know, setting performance metrics, are you the kind of person who um, feels comfortable being assertive and saying, hey, I feel like I've done this work, or how can I do a better job? Are you very assertive like that? Or are you the kind of person who is, is more quiet and reserved and really likes a manager that kind of coddles and makes sure that you're handheld every step of the way? <clears throat> so um, here's my starting point for if you should work remote. Uh, and I, I do not budge on this. Uh, with my nonprofit, we do a lot of um, coding classes for women wanting to get started in, into technical careers. And a lot of them will come to me and they'll be like, well, I want to get a remote job first. And I'm like, no, no, you do not. You do not want your first developer job to be remote. And here's why. You're going to miss out on in-person pair programming. Um, as a beginning programmer, there's a lot of context and understanding that you lack. And it, we as more seasoned programmers sometimes forget the basics, and so it can be very hard to be on the same page in person, let alone in a remote environment where you're doing some laggy screen sharing or something like that. Um, so you're really missing out on a lot of great opportunities to learn from people in person. Uh, I'm not saying that companies can't do this well and, and that there aren't experienced with it, but um, unless you land at like the perfect, most amazing utopia place, which if you do, please call me, I'll come work there. Um, but this will be more helpful for you. Um, it can be really hard to learn without visual clues, without being able to kind of point and, and um, have some of those more tactile experiences. Um, just again, really hard to convey online, especially with people working in different time zones and in different schedules. I think you're just missing out on so many learning opportunities um, if, if you were to try and pursue a remote job for your first technical job. Um, it can also be really difficult to build confidence in yourself. Um, you don't have a lot of, again, organic opportunities for interactions. Um, there's so much magic that can happen. Like if you look at a conference, for instance, you have some of the best conversations in the hallways, right? And that would never happen in a remote environment. Like you, if you go to a webinar, you're not going to have those kind of connections. 
And it's this really intangible thing that can be so beneficial. And especially if you're just, you know, grabbing a beer with a couple coworkers after work and you're bullshitting and, and they mention this approach they're taking to solve a problem on their team and you're like, oh shit, I haven't heard about that. And you talk, you miss all those opportunities because they're so much harder to create in an online environment. <clears throat> um, so, flowchart, memorize. Okay, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> how does your personality play in, and this is big, um, how many introverts in the room? Any extroverts? Okay, got a couple. All right, um, I am very much an introvert. Uh, I can get up on stage, I can talk, I can do my thing, but like after this I'm gonna be like, leave me the fuck alone, I don't wanna talk to anybody for two weeks. Um, and that does matter when you're working remote. Um, if you're the kind of person who really thrives like an extrovert on interaction with others and being around people, this is difficult for you, um, being in an isolated environment. We are gonna talk about strategies on how to handle that, but it does really play in. Um, me being an introvert with my nonprofit, I am like taking a million coffee meetings and speaking at events and doing all these things. So like I cherish this eight hours of my day where I can just sit in front of my computer and talk to no one except my cats. It's, it's delightful. So it works out really, really well for me and I do not get lonely because I do so much work in the community. <clears throat> um, are you self-directed? Are you somebody who is gonna sit down at your computer and be like, ooh, Reddit, ooh, this, ooh, that. Um, do you maybe not have as much mental discipline as you should have to make sure that you are always working when you are supposed to be working? Um, and don't raise your hands, just think about this yourself and evaluate, but um, being self-directed in a remote environment is very important. <clears throat> Um, are you comfortable asking for help? If you get stuck or if there's something going on, are you comfortable reaching out to somebody directly in a remote environment versus waiting for a more organic opportunity to come up? Um, again, it can be really easy to pass somebody in the hallway and be like, oh, you know, I, just, I was just running into this thing. What do you think about that? Um, you're gonna have to be more direct and more assertive in a remote environment to get the answers you need. So if you're not the kind of person who's comfortable with that, it might not be the best fit. <clears throat> are you comfortable in a primarily online communication culture? Um, and I, I joke about this because um, I was the kid on Counter-Strike, right? And so we were on IRC, like that's how we chatted, playing our games. And so this idea of online communication and online culture is not at all strange to me. Um, again, I refer to um, my nonprofit a lot, but um, we'll be teaching women to code in these classes and they're not um, women who grew up in the, this environment. So you're trying to explain to them a tool like Slack and they just don't understand this concept of this asynchronous chat tool, right? And I've been on like IRC since I was 14 years old. Why would you not always have a chat client open to talk to people? Like that's what us nerds do, right? Um, and so working remote is really not that different from a lot of the environments we've been raised in online and kind of the communities we've built. Um, I've actually seen remote talks where they're like, oh no, remote can't work because you can't build culture. And I think that's bullshit. Like there is entire subcultures on the internet, so that is not true. Um, so if you consider kind of the way we've grown up on the internet, whether you were playing Counter-Strike or whether you're an active Redditor or if you were in the Neopets forums, um, we have created these cultures and in, in these ways to communicate online, and so I think that very much transcends into a remote environment. Um, that being said, you probably shouldn't yell, boom, headshot, motherfucker, at work. Um, okay, so let's talk about strategies to actually be effective at working remote. Uh, strategy number one, establish and maintain boundaries. Okay, good, everybody's familiar with this GIF. I just love how she like skids around the corner, <laughs> like crawls out slowly. <laughs> Bloop. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but yes, anyway. Uh, so very important to uh, maintain boundaries as a whole. So our first boundary is maintaining office hours. Um, and so this means starting and ending your day at a consistent time, just kind of like you would at a normal job. Uh, that way your coworkers can expect when to see you online, you can set your hours no matter where they are according to your times on your schedule. If you're consistent in that, people know how they can get a hold of you and your family can know when they're not allowed to talk to you. Um, this one is huge. At the end of the day, you need to leave your desk. I don't care if you're gonna go browse the internet somewhere else in the house, leave your desk. That is your workspace, that is your office space, that is your space to be productive, end your day. Um, for me, a strategy I use is I really like cooking dinner. So it gets to be around five o'clock. I'm normally starting to get hungry anyway. 
And so pull up a couple recipes, go down in the kitchen, pour a glass of wine, start cooking dinner for the night. And so that's like a really nice boundary I can maintain. Um, a lot of people will go to the gym. So you can put these um, little like systems in place, right, to make sure that you're getting up and leaving your desk. A uh, friend of mine who um, kind of lives out um, on, a, on a cute little goat farm now, works from home, and she has a really hard problem ending her day, and she'll end up working until like seven or eight at night and because she's not good at, at getting up and stepping away. And then all of a sudden, like, you get a couple hours of sleep, you don't spend that much time with your family, and you burn out in the morning, rinse, repeat, blah, we're all unhappy. So leave your damn desk. <clears throat> Take a lunch break. Lun Breaks are good. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you're eating properly because, again, it can be really easy to get locked into your desk and just sit there, especially because we're at home and we're comfortable and I'm not fighting on anyone over the thermostat uh, because the patriarchy makes sure that all the women freeze in offices, and that's my favorite thing about working remote. Um, take breaks. Take some time for your, for your brain to adjust. They are good. Make sure that you come back and get your work done, but it's perfectly okay to get up, walk the dog, go to the gym. Um, I am religious. I go to the gym at 2 p.m. every day. Like my team knows not to mess with me. My boss knows not to schedule meetings. That is my time during the day that I am consistent about. I go to the gym. <clears throat> and so those kind of breaks in your day can, can help maintain that schedule and, and keep you in a good flow. Um, okay, here's the tough one, right? Explaining these boundaries to families and friends. Because once you work from home, you don't actually work, right? You're not actually doing anything. You're just sitting at your desk watching TV. Yeah, no. Um, use a closed door if possible. If you are not able to be in a room, um, have some sort of, of visual barrier or cue. Um, you want to you know, have something very visual for people to realize when you're in work mode and when you're not. Um, actually, Jesse Phelps did a talk at NDC Oslo this year on reverse engineering a Bluetooth light bulb. Um, technically, it was done, I think, for um, showing build status failures. But you could do the same kind of thing. You could turn it into a fun hack project with your kids at home, um, building this kind of light. And OK, well, when they see the lights on, they're not allowed to come in and bother you because you're working. <clears throat> there are the times that the visual cues fail. Um, and this is the time that your um, spouse or significant other or your mother is calling and bothering you and you're like, shut up, I'm working right now. Um, so the politer thing to do would maybe come up with some sort of code phrase that you can use when, when you really want to scream because they're interrupting you and you're trying to be productive. Um, have some sort of special code word and phrase that you can say and they'll be like, oh, yep, got the hint, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out. <clears throat> so that can be really helpful to, to maintain these boundaries with your, with your family and friends. My especially favorite is like people call me between the hours of 9 and 5 and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, working, what else would I be doing? I live in America, I don't have social security to rely on, I've got to work till the day I die. <clears throat> okay, strategy two, avoid remote traps. <clears throat> All right, trap number one, shower, please. Shower every day. The people in your vicinity will thank me. Um, but seriously, showering is a really important part of your routine. Um, something you can do consistently every day. It's going to help your mindset to be in work mode, not like grungy pajama, like you're not sure when you've changed your underwear last kind of mode. Shower every day. Be consistent. <clears throat> Do not do chores during office hours. Um, I know it seems really glamorous to be able to work from home and like do the laundry and like not have to cram everything in outside of hours. Um, but if you're doing them during their work hours, they're going to pull your focus and they're going to distract you. Okay, not during your office hours. I do not want any of you to go home and tell your partner, "Oh, well, I went to Jennifer's talk and she said I don't have to do chores anymore." No, <laughs> you better be splitting the workload with your partners at home. But do not do them during your office hours. That is a reasonable boundary to maintain and a trap to avoid. Okay, um, the hardest trap, slack social media and other distractions. We all know how easy it is to like start running unit tests and they're taking a while to boot them and you get on Reddit and you're like, ooh, what did Reality Steve say about The Bachelor now? Um, these can be really harmful. So here are a couple different um, blockers and tools if you've heard of any of these. Um, Momentum is my favorite that I use and it's kind of um, a pretty neutral one. It's just a general reminder. And it's a plugin I have installed, so anytime like I go to you know Command T to pop up Twitter or anything like this, this is going to be the first thing I see, and it's this nice, serene picture. And sometimes I'll fill in my focus for the day, and I'm like, oh yeah, Jennifer, quit being a slacker, get back to work. Um, so that's a really nice, like easy light visual cue. If you have a little less self control than I do, there are some other ones. Um, we've got Stay Focused. Um, and that's just another extension that's actually going to allow you to block and blacklist websites and, and set timers for yourself if, if that's the kind of thing. Um, if you're a more holistic person, there's this fun little extension called um, Forest. And you set it for productivity times and you start to grow a tree. And if you do anything you're not supposed to, you start to kill the tree. And so you feel bad about it. 
So um, all sorts of little tools that you can use to help uh, keep your brain on task when there's not like somebody lurking over your shoulder that would normally do that for you. <clears throat> okay, strategy number three, create a productive environment. Um, and this is a lot easier to do when we're not worried about open spaces where people are like breathing and sneezing all over you and playing their music way too loud and like shoving like stuff and kicking and just being generally annoying. So make sure you're focusing on creating your environment at home. Um, I do think that uh, we learned a lot of good life lessons from The Sims and that would be keeping a clean environment to keep our brains happy and healthy. I never got my Sims house this dirty though, I'm not gonna lie, so that's kind of creepy. Um, but definitely like pimp your office, make it a space you wanna be. Um, there's actually this really fun Twitter thread that a bunch of um, women started doing where they were posting like their sweet keyboard setups. And so it's kind of fun just to see like how other people decorate their offices and their cubes. So make it a space that you wanna be, make it a space that you wanna work. If you're that kind of person that has to have your like Lego, um, you know, stuff everywhere, or uh, my husband 3D printed me these cute little like Bulbasaur planners that I have succulents in. Like make it a space that you wanna be in and that you're gonna be excited to get up and go to work every day. Um, and you won't have to deal with traffic. The only traffic I deal with is when uh, I, I get to my office and I look and I'm like, oh, thanks cat, you threw up in my chair again. <laughs> Uh, follow a dress code. Um, and this is, again, really important to setting your mentality to make sure you're gonna be effective. I'm not gonna lie, this is definitely like my dress code. Like, I'll get ready for the gym um, in the morning and then I'll go to the gym and then the rest of the day is like pants off. Like, pants are bullshit, pants are oppress oppressive. So, um, but have your dress code, have your thing that you like to wear. It's actually really funny. The only time I ever like go shopping anymore is when I go to a conference and I'm like, oh shit, I have to wear clothes again. <laughs> <clears throat> onesies are also a lot of dress codes. Uh, we were joking about like starting to sell conference onesies where they're all like branded and then the whole like conference crew can just be like wandering around. Anyway, okay, um, become a time zone pro. If you are a person who struggles with like adding a couple hours or how many hours in your head every time, uh, there are actually a couple different ways that you can add different time zones to your calendar tool. Um, I've included Google Calendar and Outlook because I don't know if anybody uses anything else these days. Um, but having that secondary time zone for me is really helpful so I can have an immediate vi visual cue when I'm booking meetings, what's going on. Um, uh, my nonprofit's starting to do some expanding outside of, of our area in the US and so it's nice for being able to book meetings quickly with people and not have to be like, oh wait, what time is that gonna be? Um, so that can really help you with managing calendars and schedules. <clears throat> Strategy four, being visible in the company. And so this again goes back to this idea that your butt isn't in the chair, right? There's no physical man manifestation of your being. And so you might have to try a little harder to, to be visible in the company, to say, hey, I'm here, I'm awesome, look how awesome I'm being over here. Um, and if you're the kind of person that struggles with doing that, like maybe this is an opportunity for you to grow and figure out how to do that if you're gonna be remote. Um, yeah, the world is not a perfect place. You would think that just because you do good work means everybody's gonna notice, but that's not the case. Even if you're an in-person company, it does not mean anybody's paying attention to anything you do. So you need to learn to get good at promoting yourself and showcasing your work and saying, yes, I am awesome, and not just expecting that everybody's paying attention to you, because the world doesn't revolve around you, so you need to make it obvious for people. Okay, um, but before you do anything, take time to get to know the culture because I'm sure everybody's been in that situation where somebody new comes on the team and they're like, we need to do this and this and this and this and this. And you're like, okay, slow, slow your roll here. We do this way for a reason. Like figure out what it's like working with us first before coming in and recommending all these changes. But definitely like take time to observe, understand the culture, understand the team um, before you really get guns blazing. Um, check in with your team. Uh, this might be uh, Harder to do at first, but you know, even if it's just to ask a random question, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Start to build those relationships online with your team. Um, one of the ways I tend to do this is I really, if you can't tell already, love reaction gifts. Um, and so that's kind of the way I bond with people is I'll send funny reaction gifts. Although there was this one time I sent one to a new employee and he just like had no sense of humor and he was like, what? I don't understand why you're talking to me. And I was like, <laughs> so awkward. But anyway, check in with your team, um, make an effort to kind of reach out, get to know people, um, let them know how you're on a task, like if they're working on something that maybe you're familiar with, let them know you'd be happy to help. Um, just kind of start building that rapport with your team. Make others aware of, with your, of your progress and especially let them know when you're gonna be AFK. Because again, you need to be proving you're there and working, right, but you're not physically there. Um, so let's say you're going to the dentist and you, um, you know, a teammate pings you, well, if they don't know that, you, that you're at the dentist, they're gonna be like, all right, this slacker isn't here at all. Like, they're, they're not here to work. And it does happen. Um, 
they hired a QA guy on at my last job and he got fired within like two weeks and we were like, what, what the hell happened there? No, he literally wasn't like signing into work at all, wasn't doing anything and was working another job at the same time. So he's basically collecting two paychecks for doing nothing. So it does happen. I hope nobody in the room is, is that person, but um, there's always a suspicion that you might be that person. So let other people know when you aren't gonna be at your keyboard, anything like that. <clears throat> Basically be transparent, try and let people know, um, like imagine you're projecting like a physical manifestation of yourself, right? Like you are there or you aren't there. <clears throat> Contribute to team culture. And um, I think this is really big and this again goes back to kind of this idea of an online community and online culture. Um, it, it is very cultivatable. Um, <laughs> we get bored in our Slack channel sometimes and like do a Fibonacci corn. <laughs> which is what's going on here. We've gotten up to like 47 or something ridiculous and then you just see people like starting to quit that channel because they're sick of our shit. Um, but there are plenty of like goofy, fun ways that we can contribute to team culture and, and really have a good time. Um, back when I worked in a marketing agency, we had um, a, a reaction gif thread that was reacting to like agency-like situations as developers because everything's about the creatives and deadline-driven stupid project management, so we had all our, our, all our snarky shit. Um, but that can be really important to like building culture and building community and having a team that functions and thrives together well even when you're not in person. Mm -mm. Strategy five. Uh, engage with your local tech community. And this is the big one for people who are definitely extroverts and worried about feeling isolated and at home a lot. Um, so having some face time, even if it's not with people you work with, but just people in your industry can be really important. Um, there's actually a really cool compilation of all these different tech community slacks that are geographically located. And so um, Tracy has gone and like actually found all these different slacks. So for instance, I curate one for the Midwest and the United States. Um, and so that's like Kansas, that's um, Missouri, Nebraska. We've got some people that pop in from Illinois on occasion. Um, but you can find access to communities in your local area for other people you can engage with in case your coworkers aren't around with you. <clears throat> User groups, uh, you can find those in your area if you're not on meetup.com, that's one of the best ways right now. Um, if, heaven forbid, you cannot find a user group that um, matches your interest, you can actually start your own. It's not that hard, I promise. Um, find your people, uh, find great people to hang out with, go for beers after work, that kind of thing. Um, although I will say, we did do a champagne bar recently for our um, out of office outing and oh boy, we were a little tanked after that happy hour. <clears throat> Take co-working days. Um, so there are a lot of co-working spaces that have started to pop up. Obviously the main goal is for smaller companies that maybe can't afford their own building, but um, there are places that you can like offer desks uh, and it can be fun to get together with a group of remote employees in your area and all work, even though you're working on different projects, just having some of that camaraderie and, and human connection can be nice. So there are actually a couple spaces around here in Sydney for those of uh, you around, so Muse, Gravity, and Work Club Global. Uh, if you're not from Sydney, there are a bunch of worldwide spaces. WeWork is probably the biggest one with the most locations everywhere. Um, there's also CoPass, which is, um, they give you a pass uh, that'll allow you access to a bunch of different, different co-working spaces. Um, and then co-working co resources is just a general website that'll help you find different spaces wherever you live. Um, but taking co-working days can be a really fun way to kind of get outside, get out of your, um, your tiny little box that you've created for yourself at home and interact with some other human beings. <clears throat> Find mentoring opportunities, and I feel like we don't talk about this one enough, but it can be one of the best ways to engage in your community. Uh, we run a Coder Dojo chapter back home uh, that's a lot of fun, and we've got a lot of mentors get involved in that. Um, but it can be really great, just a different way to meet people, and the reason I like mentoring opportunities is uh, for the introverts, it's you're there for a purpose, so it's not like an awkward networking thing where you have to like walk in and make like bullshit small talk with people and like try and figure out how to interact. You're there to mentor, so there's normally something to do and there's more opportunity for organic conversation and that kind of thing to come up. Um, so Coder Dojo is a global nonprofit. They are all over the world, founded in Ireland. Um, there are definitely several chapters around Sydney I've linked there uh, that you can kind of check out for your area. Uh, also uh, native to Australia, there's something called Code Club AU that does a bunch of coding clubs for kids. So they can be a lot of really fun opportunities to meet other people, again, get out of the house, get out of your box, um, and help mentor the future generation of coders so they don't do stupid shit like merge their code on top of your pull requests. Um, yeah, come, come build the future engineers that you wanna work with. Uh, and finally, you guys are kind of nailing this one out of the park already. You're at a local conference. You were at the fabulous NDC. Uh, but a couple other ones in the area that you may not have heard of are Yao and DDD. Um, so they've got a couple different ones that run all throughout Australia. And I think a couple of those are in Europe as well. Um, but conference is another great way to meet people, um, uh, especially in the hallway. Some of the best conversations always happen in the hallway track. So great strategy to get out of your office. Okay, and finally, transitioning to a remote job. 
a couple different ways. I think the easiest is if you were to approach your current company. A lot of companies are moving to this idea of, of flex time and allowing one or two days out of the office a week. And that's like a really easy, non-threatening approach to an employer, right? Because it's not like all of a sudden you're gone. It's just one or two days a week and you can start to slowly broach this conversation of, working more remote and you can prove you know, that you're still gonna be just as efficient, probably more efficient, let's be real, um, working remote uh, from that way. So you can definitely try approaching your current company. A lot of times uh, I've seen people who wanna like move across the world or move somewhere away from a company and the company is so desperate to keep them, they're like, yeah, that's fine. Um, Cause God knows like we're having a lot of trouble hiring enough tech talent now. Um, so that's definitely an option um, for getting your current company on board. Uh, if you're ready to completely throw everything out um, and find a only remote job, a uh, bunch of websites here. I know um, a lot of us use We Work Remotely. Um, talk with a lot of people who actually run remote companies and so they'll post some of their jobs there. So these are some of the best places you can go to start looking for places that are remote. Uh, the good thing about these is are if they are environments that are all remote, they're gonna alleviate a lot of the problems or have solved a lot of the problems that I talked through earlier because they're used to this remote work and this remote lifestyle. There are people that do it really, really well. Um, I just don't want you get to send you guys into battle unarmed with uh, what could happen if they are not set up well for remote work and empower you to do as, as much as you can to, to be as awesome as you can in that case. Um, so yeah, different job listings there. Uh, interview prep, they are going to want to know how you're gonna manage this transition to the remote. They want, they're gonna ask a lot of questions about it. So do be prepared to ask that because especially if it's your first time working remote, they're, they're gonna wanna make sure that it's gonna be the right fit for you, um, that you're gonna be comfortable working in their environment, um, that you're gonna be able to reach out or that you're not gonna get lonely or you're not gonna get fed up after two months and just quit and leave them. Um, so you will um, have to answer those questions in your interview. So just be prepared with, with thoughtful responses to that. Um, this is probably my biggest piece of advice. It will not make things better, I promise. Um, I've seen it happen before where people assume that just if they get out of the office away from coworkers they hate or a company they hate, it's gonna be better. And now it might be better for like five minutes and you're gonna be just as miserable if worse. If you really hate your coworkers this much, just go find another, a new job. Go be a happy bird coding somewhere else. <clears throat> Okay, a couple further resources. Um, Remote Office Not Required was the book uh, written by 37 Signals uh, about how they've done remote. A lot of really great strategies in there, a lot of really great content. Um, I believe it's available on audible.com if you're a, a book and treadmill person like I am. Um, and here's actually a free ebook called Working Remotely that's just got more strategies and kind of more overview and encompassing um, this remote lifestyle we are gravitating towards. Uh, don't forget to rate the session at the end of the day. You better come to PubCon for I will hunt you down and uh, judge you for your bad life choices. Do I have any questions? I was like, meh, coffee. Cool. Yo, oh, question? If you have the mental discipline, yes, you're absolutely fine to take chore breaks. Not everybody has your level of discipline. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. That's like when I water my plants, right? Because it's just like a really nice mental break, but I also don't have to remember, like it's not another like task or workload on my brain, which is why I discourage against it, but yep. Any thoughts or refutes, complaints, concerns? Ready to drink some whiskey? Yeah. All right, have a great day, you lovely humans.